Well, thanks everybody for uh, coming along to see our interim uh, results presentation. Um, we're a local company. Um, we are 100% Trinidad focused and managed. Um, as many will know, I was born and uh, brought up in Trinidad and as regarded as a Trinidadian. Um, we've got scale in Trinidad. While we're you know, quite a small oil and gas production business, we are just under 5% um, of the country's black oil, which is quite an important number. Um, we're lean. I think if you'd seen other companies that I've built as well, particularly in the past venture production, um, we run you know, at very low cost. Um, we are a low cost operator and we'll go on to demonstrate that. And that's fundamental key is that we keep ourselves a low cost operator and that our margins uh, are maintained and that we're profitable even on a low oil price. It wasn't that long ago we were down at uh, $26 <clears throat> um, a year or two back. Um, and, you know, very much like to think of ourselves, um, we're a manufacturing business. We're not sort of an idea um, that many oil and gas companies, um, listen, London are, we're a proper, you know, full, full cycle oil and gas business. Um, we have the assets. Trinidad has got everything from, from giant ultra deep water, where BHP are currently drilling in three and a half thousand meters of water, <coughs> to family owned uh, prospects onshore and fields. Um, it's a bit like Texas, Trinidad, it runs from, from west to east, it's got everything, which also means you've got um, all the right supply chain supporting you as well, from the big, big service companies down to small local ones. We get a large well inventory, well over a thousand wells that we have the rights over, um, and we currently produce about 170 of them, but more and more every day we're reactivating. And we've got multiple targets. It's not like these wells that we deal with in, on all our assets, it's not one reservoir, uh, where we've got five, six, seven targeted horizons, which means you're very much um, in lower risk. Um, and we have large reserves and resources. I don't think Trinity's got a reserves issue at all, both either in 2P or 2C. But as a country at large, there's a huge resource base. And a lot of it has been left behind and ignored and stranded, which is the word I coined many years ago in the North Sea. Many of the reserves are stranded. We we'll go and talk about that because it's quite a rapidly changing landscape at the moment. Um, with Petrotron being restructured, and they're the national oil company that uh, dominates the onshore. We're diversified, so um, within our daily activities, we work wells over, we reactivate wells, we recomplete wells, RCPs that you've seen. That's going back into oil wells using some modern methodology looking for bypass pay. In the old days, a, a well drilled in the 50s and 60s and wouldn't be able to resolve a sand the height of the ceiling. The logs weren't good enough, the tools weren't good enough. Now you can resolve to half a centimeter. Um, so going back and looking for bypass bay is a key part of our work. And of course, drilling new wells, which we got back to sort of um, six weeks ago. So um, all those four activity sets add um, to, to giving us a stable and low risk production base. And our interests align, the board and management own 24% of the company. So we are, we are owner managers. Um, we're not um, chasing you know, astronomical salaries, we're owner managers and hence, you know, we can keep ourselves low cost because we're aligned, hopefully, uh, uh, like shareholders to deliver shareholder value. And our operating mantra, um, we work, uh, um, everybody says they work hard, but our operating teams on the ground are phenomenal. I just got back on Tuesday and whenever I'm down, Jeremy and I and Amala spend at least two or three days in the field speaking to all the operations teams and they're, they're phenomenal bunch of uh, men and women. Actually, interestingly, we've got a large, large workforce of the ladies in Trinidad, very large. In fact, our head office is dominated by, by, by ladies. Um, and that, that's fundamental in a, in a people-orientated business, that uh, your operating mantra and the way people are motivated and the way that their loyalty um, feeds back into the business is, is, is hugely important. Um, I'm not going to go through this, it's just the, the corporate snapshot that shows um, you know, where we are, what we do, um, um, you, I think you all know this, our, um, uh, uh, the, the financial data just as a snapshot of where we were and, and the ratings that we can talk a bit about. But you know, we're currently at 2000, for the first half, 2,770 odd, um, our operating costs all in, 2850, and our growth in the short term while we work the offshore up is that over 10% per year is, is our aim. Um, at this point, I will let Jeremy um, talk you through the financial statements. Thanks, Bruce. Our interim financials came out earlier today, so I'm sure some of this is there, but these are the financial metrics that we tend to look at 
And leading on from what Bruce just spoke about in terms of break-evens, um, that's one of the key things ensuring that we always sub 30 is one of the, the key metrics that we measure ourselves against that. Um, growth in terms of production of greater than 10% is what we um, had, had basically said is what we were planning to do, at least try to beat that every um, year, year on year. We've managed to do that half on half, comparing half 117 to half 118. And um, also within that, we've got operating costs as well, to which we'll go to on the other slide. But the key thing is that this is a production-led cash flow business. And hopefully we can see that through half 117 to half 18, you've got an increase in price and an increase in production, the two main drivers for the increase in revenue. But you've also then had an EBITDA that has grown alongside. And one of the things that we said when we came to market in June is that as we grow production, we leverage on a largely fixed operating cost base. And we've managed to do that. Yes, there have been some inflationary um, pressures through areas such as diesel prices, where the government has backed off on subsidies and tariffs there, and we've had to absorb that. In an oil and gas company, diesel powers many things. So that, that has an inflationary impact on us. We have throughout, though, managed to pay our people a little bit more. We, one of the things that we said last year when we came out is that um, the people on the ground, we weren't paying very well. There were no changes since 2014, and we managed to increase some of that. So you'll see some of that would have come through in terms of the operating costs and the GNA, but largely we've remained with a fixed operating cost base. And as we go forward and grow production, production growth and profitability will be larger than the increase in costs. So we intend to leverage on the, cost, the fixed cost base. So the key points here, uh, adjusted EBITDA on a nominal basis has gone from 5.9 to 9.3 million. Um, and on a per barrel basis from 13.6 to 18.6. That, that my preference is to look at, look at it on a per barrel basis because that shows the actual growth in terms of profitability. Um, break even again has remained relative below $30 and just a small increase from 28.2 to 28.5 year on year. The operating cash flow, we generated 5 million in cash flow. And just to quickly take you through a reconciliation of what happened at the end of 2017, we had 11.8 on the balance sheet. We then generated 5 million in cash and we paid back 3.3 in debt, which we had accelerated by the, by the half year. And we also put 4.4 million into CapEx. And that 4.4 million in CapEx went into continuing the recompletion program. That's what caused the increase in production towards the back end of last year into Q3, into Q4, and continued into Q1 and Q2 of this year. And <clears throat> then we drilled two wells in Q1 of this year. So we returned to drilling actually in Q1, and we, we spud our first well in August following the capital raise. So we raised capital, and in July, that money came in, and by the end of August, we had spud our first well, and we're on to our second well right now. In terms of capital expenditure, again, showing that you know, in half one 2017, we have just come out of restructuring. We didn't, we were just gearing up, executing, putting plans together before execution. Half one 2018 is showing that we've had the ability to now spend the money and execute and assure the production and grow the production. Cash balance dropped between 11.5 to 9.1, but that's the reconciliation that I've just explained there. And on a pro forma basis, if we had assumed that the capital raise had happened as at 30th of June, 2018, that's what the, cash, what the net cash position would have been with. And most importantly, debt free. The balance sheet no longer has um, the debt that it had before. Last time when we came here, we were speaking about repaying the, the um, Board of Inland Revenue, the Ministry of Energy, and the Quagmire, which is the convertible loan note. We've managed to expunge all of that debt, so the balance sheet is now clear of all debt. This slide here talks about, again, increasing margins and financial resilience. It's, it's been a theme now for our past two or three presentations that we've got this slide in because we always talk about our ability to increase margins and leverage on, on the production growth. And the bar graph on the right hand side shows that, you know, you've got the EBITDA in gray there. You, you can see between half 18 and half 17, there's an incremental growth, but we've managed to keep the break even relatively constant. So that's important. Uh, as Tracy always reminds me, we, you know, we naturally hedged for low oil prices, but and hedging is a point that, you know, we, we discuss openly amongst us in terms of what do we do? We do have a zero cost collar in place right now. And it's out of the money. Um, so you know, at the point in time we took it, which was November last year, nobody thought that the oil price would have been $60 a barrel. And now it's, I mean, this morning it's $72 WTI. So that's something that we looked at. We looked at the price. If it was above $60, what would happen to us? And we're still in a net position where we gain through the oil price, although we do have a cap on production there through that zero cost collar. But that's roughly about maybe about 25% of our production as it, as it stands, which is 25,000 barrels um, per month. In terms of the adjusted EBITDA, we went through that, That's, it went up by 37%, operating break even on <clears throat> the asset classes. So 
onshore west coast and east coast. The, the onshore is where we grew production by 20%. And you see that the break even went down. So your costs went up from 10.8 to 11.4, but your break even went down on a per barrel basis. So that showed the ability to leverage more production. Your break even went down because your costs didn't grow commensurately. So the onshore proved what we've always been saying in terms of by increasing production, we can maintain and grow and leverage the profits on that. Whereas on the East Coast, you'd have seen that the cost went up from 23.2 to 27, let's say $28 per barrel. The reason for that is on the, on the East Coast, last year when we came here and we spoke to you guys at the same time, we were operating 17 wells. We're now operating 31 wells. So we spent a lot in reactivations. And those reactivations have ensured that that field, and if you look at our trading summary, has held constant at about 1,000 barrels for the past three years easily. Fields normally decline if you just do workovers and you don't add new oil through recompletions or drilling. So we managed to hold that constant and beat decline, not even hold decline constant, we've beaten decline, held that constant. And this year, we actually increased production by bringing on more wells. So we spent a bit more in workovers and that's what's taken that cost up. But we've now got a production there that's upwards of a thousand, actually close to 1,100 barrels. And we're going to attempt a recompletion there to bring on new oil into Trinters. And that will probably take us even higher as well too. So we, we think that we've increased the cost there. There are some one-off costs in terms of workovers that we will not do on a regular basis but we brought on more well stock. And by doing so, we've assured that level of production there. So Trinters should be 1,100 or around 1,200 barrels on a, maybe for the next year or so again. So we've upped that there by spending a little bit more operating costs. GNA per barrel has gone from 3.8 to 5.0. I think on a like for like basis, um, half one of 2017 was lower than half too. So if anybody looked at the, the annual end of a GNA, I think we ended up GNA probably about a little over $4 per barrel. So there was an increase, and again, that's reflective of really us paying our people a little bit better, guys on the ground who would not have had any um, salary increases from 2014. We implemented some salary increases from the beginning of 2018. Um, this is all peer comparatives. Um, Tracy's more the expert on this, um, and she'll certainly take any detailed questions. But what we're trying to bring across here is that when you look at multiples and where Trinity trades, we tend to trade at a discount to our peers. And the peer group here, I mean, you've got IGAR, Samerisur, SDX, Ferro, Wentworth. These are all production-led. They're not, it's not a like-for-like. -like. Different fiscal regimes, different um, commercial um, contracts in place. But where we see ourselves is that we are trading at a, at, a, at a discount in comparison to where our peers are on those multiples. But yet, so when it comes to the, the underlying fundamentals in terms of profitability, we sort of right up there, you know, alongside SDX and IGAS. And as we increase production, the indicative economics show that, you know, at 3,000 barrels, um, BOPD and 3.5, we could be one of the most profitable companies on AIM. So we're hoping that we've demonstrated that we've cleared the balance sheet, so there's no debt there, and the dilution, dilutionary impact of the convertible loan note is no longer a threat. Now, we, as we grow production, we hope that we grow production and we'll have a clear pathway to grow and demonstrate that we can um, close that valuation gap. Thanks, Jeremy. This um, shows uh, the production right back until uh, January of last year when we came out of restructuring, uh, warts and all, that's the real data. Um, this is Trentus down here, then the onshore and our small west coast production in the, the blue layer above. You can see an overall uh, increase. Um, you can see though, we, we leave it in this, uh, we lost one well uh, offshore, a pump failed, but we got back in just over two weeks and restored production. And we're back up, you know, nudging, nudging towards the 3000 mark now. So we're up 16%. Um, uh, year on year, and uh, maintaining maintaining that base production, and it I, 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 it always amazes me as a geoscientist that some of these assets have been producing for 80 years, and yet still with effort into them, you can grow their production, which tells you there's a <clears throat> there's a lot of oil left in the ground. The recovery factors are very low. Some of these assets here have been producing 90 years, but we have our licenses are, are small licenses within a giant field. Um, so we're um, managing the unexpected. That pump went down. We knew why it went down. We fixed it, but continuing with, with the trajectory. This is one um, that I um, grew up when I was in Trinidad last year, just, just thinking about things and thinking about this sort of production and how it's kind of unique. Um, I think there are only reservoirs, this is particularly our onshore reservoirs like this, you know, back in Texas in the 50s and maybe parts of Russia now and, and, and bits of Nigeria where we can put effort into the ground and production continues to grow as long as we continue to work. And I've called this resetting base production. So we came out of restructuring, production was just under two half. And I would say um, base production was about two, 250 then. We never dipped below that, that was base. But every time, this is the actual production 
um, climb up until about now. Um, we've reset base and um, we're getting the team to think like that in Trinidad. Well, you know, we've come from there, but actually base right now should be about 2,700. Think of it like that, protect that base, do everything you can to protect that base while we add on more with new wells and things. And I think um, it's a pretty unique um, um, type, of, type of asset and type of company, actually. But you know, this, this doesn't come easy. It's through strong leadership. Raj Rajpal Singh, our COO, spends probably three and a half to four days a week in the field driving the teams. And we go down, um, we sit with all the teams, the production supervisors, and ensure um, they've got what they need. <clears throat> um, so, you know, it's a lot of effort, as we said, as we talked about at the beginning of, of carrying on doing all those four sets of activities. We do sit within a giant um, set of fields. And even Trinta's is just a tiny part of an anticline that contains 700 million barrels in place. So it is similar, but it's offshore. And while these are, you know, you could say traditional old reservoirs, you know, we do try a lot of new technology. The reason we've got more wells on at Trinters is we, we, we've the first, one of the first companies we think in Trinidad to ever take a PCP offshore. That's a progressive cavity pump. That's an Archimedes screw with a small motor that sits in the top of the wellhead. Um, and we've got them working offshore now. Maybe some of the wells just do 10 to 15, 20 barrels a day, but they're back on production, um, which is great. And we're, we've got a, a great thing going. I've only really seen it properly when I was down last week. Um, the team have developed a set of in-house software where we capture data in real time when things go wrong in production. So somebody drives past a wellhead and there's a burst belt on a motor. He has a text number. He sends a text into the office that says why it's down, when he observed it, and what he thinks the problem is. And that can be something very easy to see. Or we've got um, a power line down because um, a, we've a lot of rain down there recently um, and a tree's fallen on the line. And that sounds so simple, but capturing all that data and then building it and running it through an algorithm that actually outputs which wells are more susceptible to burst belts, um, the types of pumps they use, to uh, electrical um, stoppages. And it's really, it's only in its second month of, of use, but it's, it's this whole big thing that everyone in the world is capturing, capturing our data and being able to um, better predict what we need to do in line clearing and look, look for ways we can predict when things are going to go wrong. Uh, and the guys have just done this in-house. It's an amazing, and hopefully we can talk about that you know, next time we come out. But they're, they're always trying. That's to protect base production, protect base production. Lift it up, protect it. Lift it up, protect it. And in the subsurface, um, I grew up in the School of Exxon, um, where I was trained. And um, uh, one of my other senior um, technicians, Tim Daly, also started Exxon with me. So we're really actually taking a new approach to subsurface mapping. Um, we have so much well data. We've got so many well tops. We've got so many net oil sands, but people aren't thinking, what's the geometry of the sand? What's actually the original oil in place for that sand body? And if we're going to start drilling horizontal wells, we need to understand the shape of the sand so we can direct our well correctly. Um, so it's taking a very different view. And the, the first set of maps we've got on all the assets right now are much more geological in thinking about the deposition environment of the sands, the shape of them, the size of them. And, th and then you get a whole new different um, um, stock tank oil in place number when you're mapping uh, sand uh, packages rather than just mapping uh, well data. Um, but again, that's just us bringing you know, modern thinking to, to old reservoirs and old data, actually. But um, it's business assurance, as far as I'm concerned. It's protecting, protecting our production. Organic growth. You know, we talked about the onshore. We're back to that. Um, we've got um, good growth. In the onshore, it's very simple with us. We don't book reserves until we've got approved wells by management. So they've been worked up by the group, they've been reviewed by the group, then they've been peer reviewed by the greater group. And then we say, right, we can book those. So that, that, those production upgrades have come from more wells that we're getting ready to go into the hopper uh, as we've you know, restarted, obviously restarted our drilling campaign. So I would imagine as we move forward, you'll see good reserves additions uh, onshore. Um, that's much more conservative approach than, than other companies take in Trinidad. Um, uh, you can see um, um, some of our uh, assets, as Jeremy talked about, East Coast has outperformed. Different type of reservoir out there. We do see some aquifer support. Um, we run ESPs and pumps, and it seems to be in balance. 1150 odd barrels a day seems to, um, uh, is about what amount of water that's coming into the system. So the, there is some aquifer support helping drive um, that oil to, to the wells, which actually has great significance when we're thinking about developing further up the anticline for water injection. So all the numbers you see here uh, for, for Tigal 
uh, and the rest of the anticline are primary depletion, 12 to 15 percent recovery factor, that's all. But with, um, with water injection and good aqua support, you can get up to 30 percent plus. So that's, that's interesting to, to observe Trintus and see what it's doing. Just to remind you a little bit about, uh, about the onshore, kind of what it looks like. This is 5.6, um, our gathering station there. Um, that tank is delivering about 100 barrels of oil. Um, and that, that, facil that facility there gathers and processes about uh, 1,000, 1,050 barrels a day. A great asset. And this is what we talk about stacked pace. This is a well log. Yellow is sand and green is resistive oil in the sand. And these are all the different sand packages we see from about 500 feet in this well down to about 5,000 feet. So you've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven packages of sand. So we drill a new well. The only one we're allowed to um, perforate and produce, first of all, is the deepest resistive sand. Um, that's the law. And once that's depleted, then we come back up and recomplete. And that's depleted, come back up and recomplete. These are the RCPs we talk about. So every time we drill a new well, we're creating six or seven RCPs in our hopper. So that when the deepest one um, starts to um, drop off in production, we can come back up whole and reperforate and get production back up. So it's a very conventional operating environment. Um, and we talked about it earlier, the low productivity needs to be challenged by, by pump types. And, and we are doing that. Lower recovery factors. But we're really opportunity rich. I mean, onshore forest reserves produced about 1.2 billion barrels to date. And that's that people estimate. That's 10 to 12 percent recovery factor. That's all. There's been some pilot water injection, steam injection, but over very small areas that have had mixed success over the last 20 or 30 years. What we really want to do is to start to think about horizontal wells. And one of the things that I pushed the team really hard last week was um, when can we get our first horizontal well done? So um, um, you, need, you need to kind of, when you think of a horizontal well, you kind of got to reverse plummet. It's what's your reservoir like? So what's the sand body look like? What's the orientation of the sand body? And then what's the grain size of the sand body? What, what are the size of the grains that make up the sand? Because that will determine the type of completion you use, the type of mesh or gravel pack you use. So the next well we drill is actually just nudging into the sand at TD. So we're going to get some sand samples for our, uh, for, for our first horizontal well that we're hoping going to do early next year. And a horizontal well, you know, if our initial production rates from these sort of traditional sands are you know, 40, 50, 60 barrels a day, well, you can multiply that by four or five if you get it right and you can keep the well within the sand. So that, that's exciting and nobody's really done that in the traditional reservoirs. So we'll see where that takes us next year. Galeota, offshore the um, southeast coast, the big beast. Um, we've got the Trintus field producing here. You saw our release, it went through the 30th millionth barrel of production um, last month. Um, and um, some, some numbers on it here. Again, recovery factors to date about 12%, just basically the primary depletion. Um, it peaked in 1980 at 7,700-odd uh, 7, barrels a day. Again, stacked reservoirs that you see in the system here. High-quality reservoir, high-quality oil, but very shallow. So you've got to pump it, very low pressure. So these are all using um, Slumberger pumps, mostly ESPs, electrical submersible pumps. But we have a li lift watcher monitoring system. So if, um, if that's the pump in the well, it looks at the inlet pressure, the outlet pressure, and the temperature of the motor. And if it sees something that doesn't match to what we've put into the panel, um, it sends a text to Columbia that then sends a text to our petroleum engineers from the platform so we can turn the pump down, see what the problem is. And that's the way we managed to get very long run life out of these pumps. We're now, you know, five years plus on pump life. Um, then with Galeota, Tigal, it's a very simple issue, but when one looks to go exploring, you drill the crest of anticlines, anticlines. This is a cross section through Trintus and Tegal. So that's the anticline cresting and going down. Trintus is the southwest nose of the anticline. That's what was developed by Tesoro back in the 70s. Um, their size was very basic. They saw a roll over a nose. They could see following that on shore, um, there was an anticline on shore, and they went and drilled it. Um, all we've done with Tegal four years ago, is come back to the crest of the anticline and drill a well. It's pretty simple. And intersected the same sand, six sands, all stat, but, you know, virgin pressure's never been touched because they're up dip of the stuff that's been taken out beforehand. Um, so that's what we want to go and get at next. So we've put quite a lot of effort in over the last three to four months uh, on Tegal. And quite a lot's happened in the industry, obviously, in the last three to four years with the downturn that we've seen, particularly with the supply chain. So... Um, we're looking at a CSP, so conductor-supported um, piled um, jacket. 
So those little red bits there are actually well heads. So each corner, each pile's actually got a well in it. Uh, and that's how you um, reduce cost and reduce weight. Um, these are made in several parts of the world. And in, in my days at Venture, we used to pop these down in the Southern Gas Basin um, with gas wells pretty, pretty easily. One has just been put on the west coast of Trinidad. And it was a UK company, but the, the, it was built in um, the States. But a, you know, a 10 well, 10 slot platform at like that's going to be something like 14, 15 million pounds. Um, estimate. So, you know, um, nothing like what we might have imagined. Um, we're then looking at uh, a new flow line to shore. Um, in the last FDP, which was 2013-14, we had a pencil, pencil estimate of $40 million for a new steel pipeline. We now have you, uh, new quotes using composite plastic pipelines, which are used at very high temperature and depths uh, offshore Angola and various other places. Um, the physical costs for 11 kilometer lines, $1.2 million. And we reckon we can get it deployed and down for 5 million. And it just comes in a cassette off the back of a supply vessel and unwinds and you clad it with concrete weights. Um, then we thought, well, diesel prices are going up. We're running generators to run all our pumps and run lights. Um, why don't we electrify this from shore? So that's the next thing we're looking at right now is running a 11 kilometer electrical cable. Um, onshore here at Galeota, BP and the National um, Electricity Transmissions Company, t and Tech, have just done a massive upgrade to the power distribution in that part. So they've got good power. So, um, you know, we're working on running an 11 kilometer line. That will save us hundreds of thousands of dollars in operating costs. And of course, on the way past, we can electrify Trintes as well. With that, and that cable would just clamp on to the production line and be put down on the seabed. So fairly simple stuff, actually. When you put that all on the hopper and look at the economics, you've got a pretty good looking project here. So then what do we do? How, how can we commercialize that? Well, there's a very orderly way you have to do these things with governments and obviously as a board and a company. And the first thing is to get a field development plan together. All the subsurface work was done three, four years ago. That's not changed. What has changed is the topside um, solutions and the cost of that. So that FDP is being redrafted right now um, for submission uh, this year to the ministry. Once that's submitted to the ministry, then it triggers uh, all sorts of commercial discussions. Petrotron have 35% of this. We'll talk about Petrotron in a minute. They're being restructured. So in summary, we believe we're delivering on, on what we said we were going to do. We have a very strong production platform. And I hope I've demonstrated, you know, a business assurance on that in thinking every day how we project when we reset our base production is, is very important. Um, the onshore um, program has commenced. We're expecting our average production this year still to be between 2,800 and 3,000 barrels a day. But with this drilling program, you'd imagine it should uh, accelerate uh, towards uh, the end of the year. Um, we have great operating margins, as Jeremy has described. So really, in the manufacturing business, if you've got your costs nailed pretty well, well, you've just got to make more sweeties. You've got to make more barrels of oil to get your profitability up. So that's the reason we went out and, um, and raised that money was to get back to drilling. Get, get more barrels across and obviously um, you know, reduce our debt and be poised to monetize opportunities. And I'll just get onto that in a sec. Um, obviously, with, with um, East Coast, we, had, we, we, we talked about TGAL, but there's also um, um, Trintest development drilling um, to get after. I think that will crystallize once we've decided what sort of drilling unit we want to use on TGAL, because it'll do both. And we'll to bring that forward. But those, those, that's basically worked up. Um, we've talked about the horizontal wells. Petron restructuring, they've decided that they're going to close the refinery. The refinery was losing a lot of money. They have a, quite a big offshore unit called Trinmar, which I know extremely well, having bought a third of it in 1999 at Venture and got preempted by the government. Um, that does 21,000 barrels a day. Their onshore does 22,000 barrels a day, of which independent companies like us produce about 8,000. So nearly 40% nearly of the onshore is, uh, is people like us. So we're very, very important for the oil and the pure cash flow. And what they're going to do is they're going to export the oil and with that cash flow buy the products that the country needs, which is you know, a lot less than, than, uh, than running a refinery, as it were. Um, but they also have big non-operating positions up north of the Shell on NTMA. On the Dragon Gas coming in, they've got 17.5%. Then they've got 15% of the Teak Pui and Saman fields off the East Coast and little bits of Angostura. So net-net, they're a 40-something barrel, thousand barrel a day company. So I think their aim is to get sort of 800 people and turn that into a profitable unit. But the onshore is decimated within Petron. They don't have capacity in terms of people, expertise, or the will to go and do it. So 
you know, our current feeling is it's going to be long-term beneficial, but we've got to respect the pace the government's moving at and Petron are moving at uh, in order to see how that falls out. But, you know, we are, we are a local company, so we would hope that that would, uh, in the end, uh, benefit us. So, you know, uh, <clears throat> medium term, we say, going up to over 7,500 barrels a day, you know, medium term is, is sort of, you know, three to five years. Uh, but in the meantime, we work the onshore, uh, get these horizontal wells drilled next year and see what they do. That could be a, a major uh, a differentiator, how we go about our business, um, and something that's, that's absolutely called upon. Um, so we're in, we're in good shape, and uh, we just need to get on what we've got at the minute. Um, the onshore 3D seismic, that was mentioned, that's still our proposal. So, questions, I believe there's a microphone that might pop round. Uh, you talked about an onshore 3D seismic. Where, where is that likely to be? It was shot by Petrotrin in 2014 and has really never been used. It cost them $55 million. And it covers the whole southwest peninsula. Uh, north of Barrettport, right down to the Erin's Incline, from La Brea, right down to Chatham. Bruce, hi, um, Jeremy. Uh, it's Malcolm Granwood here. Um, the, the first question I had was going to be uh, about the fact that there have been effectively four companies doing the onshore work in Trinidad for the last two or three years that the market has covered. Um, and the first <coughs> question would have been what you thought about whether any of those four companies would be merged or rationalised or anything else. When I did my podcast this morning, the interviewer asked me about Predator and the reason he asked me about Predator was he said that there is an in, a sort of injection system which is being offered to them on a standalone basis, um, which is why it, that has been exciting the market so much. So that's my second question, Bruce. Injector system? Sounds like something like James Bond. Yeah. <laughs> well, I've been in this game long enough to know there is not one bit of technology that is the panacea. You need everything to work. But going back to my bit there about stratigraphy, it's just really boring if you're not a geoscientist, but you have to understand the shape and geometry of your sand bodies to know what the hell, where to inject. And they don't think like that, many of them. They put a well there, they're up dip there, but the sand body might be actually longitudinal to where the up dip well is. And I think that's been a massive problem. You know, they say, oh, there's a well with a channel in it. Oh, the, it's shaled out by here. It hasn't shaled out, the channel's just uh, meandered past that well. Big, thick, 120-foot channels don't disappear in 100 feet. It's somewhere else in the subsurface. So we're getting our teams to think about, forget about the faulting that's come later and forget about you know, um, uh, the production data. Think about the sand bodies. And, and that's really, if we can start to, well, we're looking at one sand body in Faisabad that I, we can see it clearly, it's stratigraphically trapped. That's a perfect place to inject water because it ain't going to go anywhere because it's bounded by shale everywhere. So that's a great place to, um, but I want to put a, horizontal one there first and see what it does. But you have to understand um, the geometry of the, before you even think about some magic injector. But, but the other thing you've got to remember as well, I, I don't know a lot about those, those, those companies or fields really, but if you've produced an asset for 80 years, you've produced an awful lot of oil and some water. So the voidage in the porosity of the permeability is enormous. You have to inject gazillions of barrels of water before you're going to see a proper you might get a little bit of flush, but to get, you can't repressurize the reservoir. It'd take you 100 years. And, and these people are injecting 1,000 barrels a day. You need to be injecting 30, 40, 50, 60. The North Sea days in venture, we were injecting at, at, at large 65,000 barrels of water a day, in one well. You know, it, it's, but it'll work in pockets. But I would go right back to the beginning, and you've got to get your sand geometries right and understand them, see what's happened historically in that sand geometry, if it's worked or not. Is it stratigraphically? I think there's a lot more stratigraphic trapping in Trinidad than people think. People just go to anticlines and drill. I think there's a lot more stratigraphic trapping. We do, actually, as a company. So get the sand body identified, and then that's a possibility to look further down the road. But a magic injector, good luck. We'll keep an eye on it. <laughs> well, it, you know, Trinidad's not, not unlike anywhere else in the world. You know, um, companies rationalize uh, when they need scale. And, and they need scales because their costs are ahead of them being able to lift oil profitably, generally. You put two companies together, you've got one overhead, as you know, Malcolm, you've got two. So um, it's probably required, but you, you know, you've, got to, you know, you've got to ensure that the company you're merging with has got the right assets and the right balance sheet, or else you find yourself 
in more trouble having learnt that myself four or five years ago. Toby Lubbock, I'm just a small shareholder. Um, PetroTrin and the changes that are happening there, um, you, um, you used to just um, uh, sell the oil to PetroTrin. Now you're going to have to export. Is that going to have implications? No, we, don't. They, we sell to them and they export. And they export? Yeah. Right, so that's not going to have any... My question was, are there going to be implications for your cost per barrel? Um, not at this point. I mean, uh, four years ago, the Cat Cracker, which is the big distillation unit refinery, went down for eight months, um, and they exported oil for product for eight months and never told the public. They didn't tell us. We found that out later. Um, so they've done it before. Um, uh, and their cash flow will be generated by selling the 40-odd thousand barrels a day of indigenous oil internationally. That's going to be their business. Um, you know, um, so they, make much difference, right? well, well, there will be a pricing discussion. There'll be a pricing discussion to be had because, um, um, you know, we, our offtake agreements are renewed now and again, so we'll need to see what that says. But they've already sent us letters, and we've already had that discussion with them. Um, it's, it's, not to, it's really important to understand that Trinity is a local company. So we've got relationships and understand what's going on the ground very deeply. And, but as I've said to all the staff from me down, we've got to be really sensitive down there because it's a very sensitive time. This is not when you go in with the size 15s and knock the door down and say, what can we do for you? You've got to work around and see how you can help them really, and, and that's, they, they helped us in the tough times. They were very, very good to us, and you know, we remember that. We also have the right to export our oil off the east and west coast as we, as we see fit. So if we have to, we can export those units, and most of the other independents in Australia can't do that. They haven't got offshore fields. Thank you very much for coming. Really appreciate it. It means a lot to us. Thank you.